so um, warm uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is the, the second event uh, of the uh, Robert H. Eno, uh, Family Foundation lecture series on Chinese Buddhism of this year. Um, you might remember that we had a, a, a launching event on uh, um, Buddhist art, Ch Chinese Buddhist art and material culture. And this particular lecture will be engaging with the broader team of uh, uh, the intellectual history uh, of uh, Chinese Buddhism. And uh, of course, it is my pleasure to uh, uh, thank again the, the Ho Family Foundation for uh, their, uh, their support in uh, developing this uh, very exciting uh, series uh, of uh, lecture. Uh, it's also a, a particularly uh, great pleasure to, to be opening uh, what promises to be a highly interesting talk by one of the leading figures uh, in the field uh, of uh, Buddhist philology as a whole, uh, of Buddhist philosophy, and of Chinese Buddhism. Um, and um, I um, also take some, uh, some uh, pleasure and also uh, some emotion in introdu introducing this, what will be the last talk I chair as a chair of the Center of Buddhist Studies, uh, because as some of you know, I will be uh, leading to us uh, at the end of this year. Um, and since uh, I am not myself uh, an expert of Chinese Buddhism, as is very well known as well, uh, uh, and uh, since I didn't uh, have the, um, the, the privilege to, uh, to read uh, a lot of uh, Professor Funayama's work because uh, he has published extensively in, uh, in Japanese, in uh, a language I have yet to learn, uh, I have asked uh, uh, a very dear friend of uh, Professor Funayama and very uh, 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 well-known expert of Buddhist studies uh, uh, and a very uh, 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 grand connoisseur of uh, 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 also Japanese scholarship uh, who has been bridging a lot between the uh, both worlds of uh, Japanese Buddhist studies and uh, uh, Buddhist studies in, uh, in Europe and in America. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to invite uh, Professor Jonathan Silk, who is professor in the study of Buddhism at Leiden University, to uh, present properly uh, uh, Funayama Sensei. Well, thank you very much, uh, Soissant, um, uh, for your kind introduction of me to introduce uh, Professor Funayama. I, I think part of what you said is, was slightly misleading. I'm also not a scholar of Chinese Buddhism and did not claim to be, but that's certainly not true of our guest. But to say that he is a, uh, a scholar of Chinese Buddhism is um, also, in a sense, misleading because the implication is that that is what he does. But in fact, uh, Professor Funayama is in some respects almost unique in that his um, background and his formation in the, in the French sense um, is uh, actually in both the study of Indian Buddhism and in the Buddhism of China. And he began his work, and if you look at his uh, quite extensive publication record, uh, both in English and in uh, Japanese, what you will find is that he has uh, contributed um, extensively, and um, so both broadly, I would say, but also very deeply to the study primarily of logic and epistemological traditions of later Indian Buddhism. Um, at the same time, he is also a specialist indeed in uh, Chinese Buddhism. And um, I wanted to, in the course of introducing him, to talk just a little bit about um, why I think what he brings to the study of, uh, of Chinese Buddhism is um, uh, well, it's a very overused word and usually used incorrectly, but I think in this case one can say what he brings is really unique. And the reason is as follows, that um, uh, for a long time in the modern history of the study of uh, Buddhism, scholars have appreciated sources in Chinese. And those people who are interested in the study of Buddhism from the Indian side primarily have looked at Chinese sources and tried to understand how they can be read and used, really, if one is honest about it, as a kind of encoded Sanskrit. So these are Indian texts which happen, unfortunately, to be written in Chinese. 
So that's one way of looking at it. On the other hand, scholars who are looking at Chinese Buddhism view, generally speaking, sources in Chinese as sort of universally available. Whatever is there, you just kind of look at it. Um, because of Professor, I would think it's fair to say, because of Professor Funayama's unique background and the kind of problematic he brings to the study, he looks at um, Chinese sources, that is to say sources in Chinese, and tries to understand them with different lenses, not just a single <coughs> lens. And one of the things that he has really stressed in, I would say, his scholarship over the last 10 or 15 years is that our um, adoption of a way of understanding Chinese sources as either authentic Indian sources or Chinese apocrypha or forgeries or questionable texts, this is really to fundamentally misunderstand their nature. Um, and so in the course of his research, he has asked questions like, what does it mean to translate a text into Chinese? How does that process work? Not in the sense of trying to know what did the person who the, the colophons tell us took up the brush, what did he do, but rather conceptually, what's going on in the process of transforming Indian material into Chinese? What happens when um, scripture summaries are produced? What happens when texts are produced that are inspirationally Indian, but in some sense composed in China? And um, he used the example, if I remember right, um, of the production of a car, or was it a stereo, or something like that? Anyway, the production of a car is an easy enough example. You have a car which is put together in Ohio out of some Japanese parts, some parts which come from Southeast Asia, and it's put together and it gets the name of a Japanese car maker on it. What, what is that a Japanese car? Is it an American car? What is it? And it's, I think what Professor Fanama suggests is this is the wrong question. So um, in that perspective, he is also looking at um, and he will talk to us today, I think, about a very important text, which we will, a small part of which we will read together tomorrow, um, which is one of the foundational texts, in fact, for all of East Asian Buddhism. And I am not going to tread on his territory by talking about the content, but simply to say that all of us are really thrilled and delighted to have with us um, uh, a truly interesting scholar. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Really kind and thoughtful comments of Professor Silk. Does this move? Uh, mm -hmm. That's so, the closest it's going to get. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for all of you for coming to this lecture. And it is my really my great honor to be here, actually, the first for the first time at SOAS. And uh, I also am thanks and uh, the Robert Hall Foundation who support and which supports my visit. And of course, uh, I want to say thank you very much for the all kind arrangements done by Dr. Bonson Tunier. So I would like to start my talk uh, this is related with one of my recent topics. And uh, the main text uh, I'm talking today is nothing to do with uh, the Indian Buddhism, actually, because it is called apocryphal text. But the, the, I would like to suggest some common characters between the Indian Buddhist sutras and Chinese apocryphal texts. In the, in, the, in the final part of my talk. So I want to start. Can I do this? Which one is this one? Ah, OK, thank you. So the text I will take up today is called Fan Wan Jin in Chinese. This Chinese Buddhist scripture exerted enormous influence on the formation and evolution on the idea of bodhisattva precepts in East Asian Buddhism. Traditionally, 
it is regarded as an authentic text of Indian Buddhism, translated by the Central Asian monk Kumara Jiva, who was active at present-day Xi'an, or the old Chang'an, during the first decade of the 5th century. However, numerous modern studies have clarified already that it is not a pure translation, but a Chinese Buddhist apocryphal. The term Chinese Buddhist apocrypha refers to those scriptures or the genre of such scriptures that while appearing in, in form to be purely Chinese translation of a scripture or sutra originating in India were in fact composed in China. The today's text, Falun was most probably composed during 450 and 480 CE. The main, the main context, main contents, I'm sorry, main contents of the text are bodhisattva precepts or bodhisattva's daily life in general in Mahayana. However, the precepts include the teachings such as do not kill any living beings do not tell a lie, or do not eat meat, do not drink alcohol, which I don't like. <laughs> yeah. All of which represent general aspects of Mahayana. The Fawan Jin also indicates or includes some quite unique rules too. One of which is do not eat five pungent vegetables. The five pungent means five kinds of vegetables which intensively, uh, with intensive odor, such as garlic and green onion. So, now let's think about the meaning and the possible translation of the title, Fan Wan Jin. Maybe you feel very strange about my questions about the, the, the translation of Fan Jin, but actually after I carefully uh, studied the contents and tried the Japanese translation, I found that nobody had carefully thought about this problem. <laughs> so as a matter of fact, this is a big problem. Previous studies use the translations such as Brahma's Net Sutra or uh, Brahma Jala Sutra. But I feel it inappropriate to use these translations. One of the reasons is the use of Sanskrit words. The typical case is Brahma Jala Sutra. All three words are Sanskrit and not English. It is difficult to explain why this Sanskrit translation is convincing and why it is possible to use Sanskrit words for the title of Chinese Buddhist Apocryphon. Uh, Fan Wanjin is not a translation of Sanskrit text. Therefore, the equivalent Sanskrit did not exist in India. Nevertheless, modern scholars like to use Sanskrit words for translation. It is very strange to me at least. In Chinese Buddhism are translations of Sanskrit word Brahma as cre creator god in Hinduism. And then the, the Brahma is used in the masculine singular form in Sanskrit. However, to the contrary, the Fan Jin itself uses the sinograph, Chinese characters, Fan, always as plural not in singular form, without exception in the text. Therefore, the meaning of fan cannot be creator god Brahma in the singular form, in, this case, in the case of this sutra, this uh, Fan Wan Jin. 
I understand that fun means pure divinities who came to hear the Buddha's teaching of this text, each holding a stick, a stick with banners, the top of which is ornamented with a special kind of net. By the way, I tried to explain by using illustration, but I can't, it was not easy to find the, the best pictures I want to use, but I just found this one. <laughs> I imagine this type of stick with banners. And in some cases, Indian gods or Indian bodhisattvas holds this stick and banner flaps like this. So I think this is the meaning of the, the, the title, Fan Jin. Thus, I like to propose a new translation of the title, Scripture of Pure Divinities, Netted Banners. But let me stop talking about my arguments here because of time constraints. This year in March, I have published an over 500 page monograph about the Fan Wan Jin. The book has seven, seven chapters and the two chapters are directly related to today's talk. In chapter two in orange, I made an edition of the text by using 22 versions of manuscripts, stone inscriptions, and later woodblock print, printed editions. And this is the breakdown of 22 sources I consulted to make a critical edition. Can I go back to previous page? How can I go back? This? No. Which one? It's okay. Ah, this one. Oh, I, thank you. Another point I personally think significant is chapter five. This one. It is the world's first study of an old important manuscript of the Fan Wanjin copied in 757 CE, currently preserved in Kyoto National Museum, Japan, registered as important cultural property of Japan. Chapter five is a diplomatic edition of the whole manuscript, including marginal notes. I'm sorry, I can't show you the picture itself because of the, because I don't have any permission of the museum. <laughs> but this is the one I tried, I published in chapter seven. So this is the main part. And sometimes the, these words are emended by using marginal space. And there are some comments on the top sometimes. And uh, this manuscript itself has two colors, black and, black and red. But in the case of the, the novel publication, since I don't, I can't use two colors. So I distinguished the, the difference of colors by using brackets. This means red, written by red ink. Next, I will explain the basic con contents of the text. Fan Wan Jin is made of two fascicles, or in Chinese language, it is called scrolls or chuan. Fascicle one is spent for the detailed explanation of Bodhisattva's religious practice, especially on the 40 stages of Bodhisattva practice. And Fascicle 2 is renowned for its unique theory of the 10 major and the 48 minor offenses or transgressions Bodhisattva should not do. The term major offenses signifies the 10 most serious offenses for the Bodhisattvas 
such as intentionally killing other beings. If a bodhisattva commits a major offense in an intentional way for many times, then he or she is not a bodhisattva any longer. As a result, the possibility of enlightenment and salvation is extinguished. Thus, the Fanwanjin is fundamental to understanding the history of Mahayana practice in Sinosphere. Furthermore, the text has philological significance too. Too many variants. That's my point. I want to talk about this one. Uh, we normally rely on the Taisho canon, a modern canon, as the basis for the study of Buddhist texts. The Taisho edition of the Fan Jin is a version of the text copied from the second Korean edition, which was made in the first half of the 13th century, along with a collation of five Utpok printed editions dating from the 12th century or later. On the other hand, extant versions of Fan Jin dating to earlier periods include early Dunhuan manuscripts, one stone steely version or stone version from the 8th century, and two Japanese manuscripts, one dated 757, as I said, and the other in 9th century. They reveal intriguing details concerning the formation and reformation of this scripture. Generally speaking, the use of manuscripts of the Fan Wan Jin offers two important contributions to philological research, I think. First, a careful comparison of early manuscript and Utbrock print editions reveals that the Fan Wan Jin was reformed again and again over the centuries. Manuscripts before the 10th century offer particularly valuable data about the text's earlier form as it existed prior to the Woodbrook printed editions of the Buddhist canon, which started with Kaibao canon at the end of the 10th century. Second, a large number of variants in the Fan Wan Jin are worthy of attention. The second fascicle of the Fan Wan Jin, seven pages long in Taisho edition, has more than 300 locations for which variant, variant readings exist, 300, more than 300 variants. This is a quite a large number when compared with other texts. For example, the second one, Gunabhadra's translation of the Sri Mala Devi Sinhanada Sutra, Shaman Jin, is of nearly the same length, seven pages in Taisho. but it has only 79 locations of variant readings. Actually, 79 means very many. Similarly, the first seven pages of Xuanzang's famous translation of the Great Sutra of Wisdom, Mahaprajnaparamita, have only 24 locations of variant readings in the first seven pages. So compared with these cases, the existence of more than 300 locations of variant readings of the Fan Wan Jin in Taisho edition deserves special attention. Moreover, by incorporating variants from nine ma manuscripts, two stone carvings, and 11 woodblock print editions, I have found that the number of variants becomes much higher than the given in the Taisho canon. The, the number of variants in my book is over 660. So just compare the number of 660 with Xuanzang's translation of Great Sutra of Wisdom, which has only 24 variants. So I'm tempted to think about, ask my the very naive question, 
what is the difference of this? Maybe in the case of the Great Sutra Wisdoms, Great Sutra of Wisdom, uh, it is a repetition of the stereotyped expression over uh, in throughout the 600 uh, fascicles. So actually, it is not very interesting <laughs> to read through. And I've heard that the, 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 the latest guy who read through the 600 Juan of the Great Sutra of Wisdom is not human, but <laughs> scanner. <laughs> I think this is true. <laughs> but in case of the Fan Jin, it has in 600, over 660 variants. And I think that uh, it is because of it shows the curiosity of readers and they could understand the contents. Therefore, and it is directly related with their actual life as Bodhisattva practice. Therefore, they can c compare the contents of the text with what they are doing in reality. So if there is any difference, readers are attempted to, tempted to change some wording. Therefore, such a big number of variant readings took place. This is my personal speculation. Please see the next slide. I want to speak about the implication of Fan Wan Jin's too many variant readings. I pay special attention to the two points. First, the Fan Wan Jin of the Taisho edition does not show the form before the production of the Woodblock editions. Still more, the earlier text in the form of manuscript to say nothing of the original form. Taisho edition only, uh, they are based on the woodblock print editions, which is uh, probably seven, more than three, 700 years after the original sutra. And second, the number of variant readings in the Fan Jin is too many to an unprecedented level when compared with normal Chinese Buddhist translations. Here, a lot of people, including me, may, may have questions. For example, how was the Fan Wan Jin prior to the woodblock print age? Can we get, uh, get access to the original form, which was composed in the fifth century? And why were such copious amounts of variants made in late later periods. Actually, I want to ask these questions to me, or I want to ask someone else who knows, but <laughs> it is not easy to make a reply to these questions. So in order to give possible answers to these questions, I think it is significant to divide a long history of the Fan Wan Jin roughly into two periods. In the first period, number one, the earliest form of the text we can attest through 22 versions prevailed in China, actually. It is the period around 500 to 700 CE. As I said above, the original text was composed around 550 to 80, uh, 450 to 80, I'm sorry. Therefore, the first period, 500 to 700, cannot directly relate it with the original period of the text. Nevertheless, this is the, the, the earliest period we can trace and identify by using philological sources. In fact, it is impossible to confirm the original form by any of extant versions, simply because we don't have a manuscript in the 5th century. However, at the same time, we can philologically 
ascertain the earliest, if not original, form of the Fanwan Jin on the basis of plural sources. They are old manuscripts and the old, oldest commentary. There are three manuscripts, actually. One is Tunghuan manuscript, BD 1972-2, currently kept in Beijing, China. The Chinese catalog suggests the dating 7th or 8th century. The second manuscript is a catalog. Uh, second manuscript is a Chinese manuscript formerly kept by Nakamura Fusetsu, Japanese calligrapher, currently kept in Calligraphy Museum, Tokyo. Fortunately, beautiful color pictures of the manuscript are published. The third manuscript is dated 757 CE in the color form, currently preserved in Tokyo National Museum, Kyoto National Museum, as I said before. In addition to these uh, three manuscripts, we can also consult the oldest commentary entitled Commentary on the Bodhisattva Precepts, composed by Qi. This is noteworthy that this commentary is based on remarkably old wording sometimes of the Fan Wan Jin. Therefore, by using these plural sources, we can make a critical edition of the earliest form not, if not the original, earliest form of the text to ascertain the textual form in the first period. The second period, this one, number two, in blue color, uh, signifies the start of revisions or emendation. In other words, foundation of later editions. This period started around 700 CE. With regard to this period too, we have two kinds of historical sources to ascertain the initiation of revision. One is what is called stone sutra or stone carving produced at Fanshan near Beijing in the early eighth century. Another one is a manuscript available online it is a Japanese manuscript in the 9th century, formerly kept in Horyuji Monastery, Nara, and currently preserved in Tokyo National Museum as important cultural property. The other source is Fa, Fa Zan's commentary, composed nearly at the same time at the turn of the 8th century. The variant readings commonly attested in the, the three texts and Fazan's commentary unanimously indicate that the change of the text started around the beginning of the 8th century. There are examples of three significant manuscripts in the first period. This is the one, Tunghua manuscript and uh, Nakamura Fusetsu collection, and this is the, the one preserved in Kyoto National Museum. And actually, this is uh, used by, by using two colors. This is OK, because uh, this, is, uh, this is open. The first part is open on, online. <laughs> and uh, uh, next one. These are examples of the two important sources in the second period. One is Fan Shan Stone Sutra, carved in stone, around the beginning of the 8th century. And another one is Horyuji Manuscript in the 9th century. And the classification of the two periods are summarized in this way. First, we can assume the original form composed by the original author or authors uh, around 450 to 480. But we cannot attest this form by using any kind of manuscript. And uh, from the philological sources, we can divide the period into two 
succeeding periods. The one is the earliest form. This is from 500 to 70. And the revision started, or foundation of later editions started, around 700 CE. So this means that the, there is a border between before, either before or after 700 CE. And that is exactly the, the, the time when uh, this stone version was carved. And the Fazan's commentary also was made, composed at the, exactly on the, at the same time. So uh, what are characteristics of textual emendation in the second period? That is my next question. First of all, I must emphasize the fundamental feature of the text in the first period. Uh, usually, uh, we assume that the original form of the text shows the best form, and by lapse of time, later transmissions expose a variety of deterioration of the text. So the quality is getting lower and lower and lower. In contrast to this usual assumption, the earliest form of the farm engine certainly gives evidence of rather low quality of wording, both grammatically and stylistically. So it's very hard to read, and it's very strange text. In short, the earliest text around 500 to 700 CE is full of ambiguous and inconsistent words. I will give some typical example of this feature on the next slides, but before that, I want to claim that the problem of quality in the first period caused the necessity of revision in the second period because of the bad character of the, the, the earlier form, people at later period had to change or improve the wording. And under the condition that the earliest form has ambiguity and inconsistency, the readers are quietly requested to react to the problem of the first period. The reaction has actually two options. One is to leave the text, all the text as it is, without any change. This type. In this case, ambiguity and inconsistency of all the text are not resolved. In fact, there are lots of such passages in the text of the second period too. The other option is to revise the text or change the wording. This bold reaction realizes clear and consistent wording. However, at the same time, revision of the sacred text may have something to do with the criticism of or refutation of Buddha's words. So pious believers are very careful about changing words. Two kinds of emendation is possible, as I wrote, shown here. One is emendation concerning the meaning and thought. However, this type of emendation is a small minority in the case of the Fanwanjin. The other type of emendation is stylistic improvement of wording without changing the meaning of the sentence. The great majority of emendation belongs to the second type, this second type in the case of the Fang Wanjin. More importantly, a large majority of those variants suggest not scribal errors, but a clear intention to improve ambiguous or inconsistent wording in the original text of the Fang Wanjin. Indeed, some kind of emendation should be caused by scribes' carelessness or the lack of concentration. 
but the number of such miscopying is very few in the case of Farman gene. So here are three examples of the first case of emendation. First case means this one, emendation concerning religious, religious meaning, which is very few. The earliest form has the expression Buddha's great precepts, like here. Great is colored. Blue. And it was amended to Buddha's precepts of great vehicle, or Mahayana, by adding the sinograph, shun, vehicle to express the attitude of Mahayana fundamentalism, in my conjecture. The second example show a slight, slight change of meaning from practicing or acting as bodhisattva to practicing bodhisattva path by adding sinograph Tao, or path. The third example is concerned with the similarity of, of character form between Zhu, master, this word, and Shen, living. As I said, only a small minority of emendation belong to this type, however. The next, next slide shows three other examples of the second type stylistic emendation without changing meanings. The first example is an, is an attempt to resolve grammatical ambiguity of the first, first uh, phrase. I mean, the first phrase means here. So the earliest form just said, any sick person respect just as the Buddha. So the meaning, the, each word is clear, but it is very unclear uh, from the meaning. So later edition add these three Chinese characters, adding seeing. That means that when you see any sick person, then you always should respect them just as you respect the Buddha. So by adding three characters, the, the syntax and the grammar becomes very quite clear. And the second example aims at consistent phraseology before commit a light and impure offense. So this is, there is no change around here. But the former part uh, improved by using ro and zhe, which means that if you do not on purpose, then zhe means that end of conditional clause. Then you commit a light and impure offense. So by using four character expression, which is quite common in Chinese Buddhist translation, the, it is rewritten in this way. And uh, it is a clarification of the syntax of if and then. The third example is interesting, at least to me. On the basis of Buddha nature thought, which is very deeply concerned with the essential part of the Fawan Jin, this text evidently assumes the existence of the poten potentiality for any animals to become a Buddha in the future. So even a cat can be a Buddha later. <coughs> and hence, the text says in a context like this, in, a con in one context, your hey, animal, you are an animal, arouse the mind of bodhisattva. And then it was 
changed into, hey, you are an animal, arouse the mind of enlightenment, or arouse the mind for enlightenment. This phrase is common in Buddhist texts. Okay. The problem of emendation in the second period is uh, deeply related with the Chinese attitude to sacred text, I think. The Falun Jin has more than 660 variants in 22 versions. This is an extraordinary number, I think. The question is why such a huge number of corrections were necessary for this text. As I said above, this is based on the nature of the earliest form of the text as being of rather low quality of expression in terms of ambiguity and inconsistency. This is indeed true, but what was the intention of those who dared to change the wording of sacred text? Did they attack the Shakyamuni Buddha or not? In order to answer this, I want to draw your attention to the Northern Song commentator, whose name is Yu Xian, this person, Yu Xian, who died 1163. A careful reading of his commentary on Tiantai Qi's classical work, Commentary on the Bodhisattva Precepts, reveal that Yu Xian held two interesting views for the critical selection of variant readings. I mean that uh, his commentary, called as such in Chinese, is a kind of sub-commentary on Qi's commentary. So commentary on commentary. As for the reasons for adoption, Adopting a certain reading, Yu Xian certainly gives priority to the founder of this school, Qi. For example, Yu Xian says, this is our must, great master's reading, therefore we have to take that. <laughs> so this is conservatist idea, I think. And when he agrees on the reading of someone else, which is not Qi's reading, uh, he says, it is also fine, or it also makes sense, although it differs from great master's reading. So this is a logical um, choice, I think. More interesting are the reasons for the rejection of a variant, I think. Number, number here, reject, reasons for rejection of other variants. So he, Yu Xian says, errors and omissions, wrong omissions, can happen at any time. This is really modern scientific idea, don't you think so? <laughs> he also says, later scribes easily fail to make a correct copy. Like me, I always <laughs> miss, miss copy. <laughs> and this is a scribal error. This is also one of typical examples of Yu Xian. And these expressions suggest Yu Xian's view on the nature of manuscripts. Namely, manuscripts are far from perfect. And they are not free from scribal errors. So let me summarize Yu Xian's idea in his commentary. He claims the necessity of improvement of the Falun Jin. And he tried to uh, justify his uh, choice. And his idea is just like this. First, Yu Xian takes the Falun Jin not as an apocryphon, but as a Kumarajiva's authentic translation. This is the idea opposite to modern view. We call Falun Jin as apocryphal work. And consequently, to Yu Xian, 
The Fan Wan Jin is the Buddha Shakyamuni's true words. It is nothing to do with apoc apocryphal character. And second, Yu Xian considers that no manuscript is free from scribal errors. Third, Yu Xian attempts to improve the transmitted Fan, uh, Fan Wanjin in China and consequently restore the original state of the Buddha's words as correctly, correctly translated by Kumarajipa. Yu Xian's intention is not to deny the Buddha's wording itself, but to correct the garbled Chinese text after Kumarajiva's death. And fourth, Yu Xian does not take into account the possibility of Chinese scribal emendation in a time between Kumarajiva and himself. So he just gives the negative evaluation to scribal function. My explanation is tentatively based on Yu Xian's commentary only. Therefore, it is still a matter of speculation. However, I hope that this case, uh, this case study will lead to our better understanding some, sometime in the future. So, among the four points, the fourth especially thought-provoking to me. Exactly the same view is found in the latest philological work of Professor Dr. Ernst Steinkelner, Vienna, in his edition of the 8th century Sanskrit commentary on epistemological work of Indian Buddhism. He wrote in this way, And in my words, uh, uh, Steinkelner states the, two, the following two points. These two points. Number one, only the author's work is important in the case of Mahayana treatises. And number two, Scribal changes are all wrong and valueless in the history of thought. For example, Nagarjuna's work is important, but the scribes copying wrong errors of Nagarjuna's work is meaningless. In my view, uh, Steinkelner has in common with Yu Xian with regard to their negative evaluation of scribal improvement after the author. However, I suppose that there is still some room for re-evaluation re or reconsideration of scribes' activity or scribes' role. Steinkelner's view is quite understandable and correct, I think, because he deals with a philosophical work of a single author. However, on the other hand, how about the case of Mahayana Sutras and other Orthodox Sutras in India? We know that Wisdom Sutra, Prajnaparamita Sutra, in India has a history of often repeated rewriting and re-editing again and again. And the same is true for the history of other Indian Mahayana Sutras, such as Lotus Sutra, Sattarma Pundarika, which has, which has various Chinese translations and Sanskrit versions. Therefore, I don't think that Steinkelner's attitude, is, attitude to single-authored philological work is applicable to Sanskrit Mahayana Sutras too. If we totally deny the evaluation of later revision or re-edition, we cannot explain a long history of Mahayana Sutras over centuries. Furthermore, exactly the same viewpoint uh, is indispensable when we trace a uh, history of Fan Wanjin and its later reformation.
So needless to say, there is a fundamental difference between the Indian Mahayana Sutras and Chinese Buddhist Apocrypha. The former is made in India and the latter in China. Therefore, the language, used language, is also diff different. And uh, the actual way of revision and re-edition has di also difference. Indic Mahayana Sutras often realized reformation in the form of either enlargement or deduction. Sometimes uh, new chapters were added for, the enla for enlargement of the text. However, such a kind of revision is not found in the case of Fawanjin. Emendation is real realized by changing some Chinese characters on the minimal level and not addition and, or deduction of sections is discernible. No deduction and de uh, deletion is discernible. In spite of such fundamental difference, we are able to find some characteristic uh, characters between them. Firstly, both Indic Mahayana Sutras and Chinese Buddhist Apocrypha has anonymous works, are anonymous works. And those anonymous authors were active after the Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha. And secondly, both have a kind, a long history of reformation and reformation of the earlier text. I'm sorry. The most uh, noticeable affinity is the fact that later changes of words were made not by mistakes or errors, but with a clear intention for revision of the text. In this sense, it is decisively important to give the changes of worthy, the positive evaluation in the case of Mahayana sutras and Chinese Buddhist apocrypha. So finally, uh, I'd like to speak about the methodological remarks on the condition uh, editorial work. Of course, I intend how to edit a text like the Fan Wan Jin, which has a large amount of variance and evolves even after the formation of the original form. In the case of the critical edition of the earliest form of the Fan Wan Jin, it is possible, to, possible enough to make a critical edition based on critical apparatus in a normal way. For example, the slide on the, s the screen, like this, sli slide on the screen, is a critical edition of the earliest form and the critical apparatus on the second uh, major offense in my monograph. Here, I just follow the normal traditional way and the uh, presentation in Indian uh, Buddhist philology. My method here has no contradictions with Steinkelner's methodology because I'm, I aim to present the earliest form of the text by using the 22 versions. Therefore, the style of critical apparatus is also fit for the normal methodology. I admit that the Editorial work goes well in so far as I present the earliest form as critical edition. However, at the same time, I see a serious problem of this type of critical apparatus regarding the, the later evolution. It is almost impossible to understand what kind of revision was made 
in later periods, if we, when we see this list of <laughs> change. So this is uh, effective to confirm the earliest form, but this is not really good to explain later development or later changes, in my conjecture. In order to solve this problem, I decided to add a selected list of later editions in two pages of my monograph, like this. I chose, I, I, first I presented the, the earliest form in a, as a critical edition, and this is the basis of my critical decision. And after that, I uh, introduced six kinds of uh, the other uh, important recensions in a chronological sequence. And uh, one manuscript in 757, this one. And the next one is the one stone sutra at the beginning of the 8th century. And the next one is one manuscript in the 9th century. And actually, these three sources are much prior before than the, before the, the, the Woodbrook plant editions. And this actually suggests the first original form. And this shows the, the start of revision. And this also reflects the start of revision. And then later, I presented the, the first edition of Korean Triptaka, and then Piru Zan, and then the most famous one for us, the second version, second edition of Korean Triptaka. So in this way, I presented, I made a list of six major versions as diplomatic editions, not a critical edition, diplomatic edition. Only difference is that I try to add punctuation in order to make it clear. So I think uh, this is the one I try to uh, present in my new monograph. But uh, this is, in a sense, just a mixture of the, the critical edition in the Western style and uh, the, the diplomatic edition in the East Asian traditional style. But uh, at least I, f I thought that only this critical apparat from this critical apparatus, it is extremely difficult or actually almost impossible to understand the rate, later changes. Therefore, I wanted to add these later versions by choosing, not showing all of them, but choosing only six important ones. And in order to make it clear, I also add underline like this for easy comparison between this and this and this, this. So I don't know whether my new work and new idea goes good, or anybody else will follow me. I don't know, <laughs> but I would like to present as a one style or one challenge to go to proceed just one step further to the to the next age. So, any critical remarks is welcome. Thank you very much. Clearly, see that it represents a consider considerable work and uh, 
thoughtful uh, thinking about how to represent the kind of life and plurality of, uh, of a most central text. Uh, it shows also the, very much the connection between the kind of diversity and use, uh, mm -hmm. a text that has been used and read and, and reread and reinterpreted as a result, and not unlike the, yeah, the larger Pratinia Paramita, uh, <laughs> which maybe was never read <laughs> in full. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it was an extremely interesting uh, question uh, on the kind of uh, methodological level as how to, how to deal with uh, multiple texts uh, with uh, leading tasks. Um, um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. There was a lot of chattering on the, on the front row. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure they are uh, getting ready to articulate their questions. Um, maybe to, to open up the, the discussion, uh, I was wondering whether, um, um, so you, you, you uh, about this issue of Ur text, uh, you contrasted uh, the, 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 the contrast you established between Shastras and uh, Mahayana Sutras and grouping the, uh, 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 very much the, the, apocryph the Chinese apoc so-called apocrypha in the continuity of Mahayana Sutras uh, uh, was between being the Shastras being author text and uh, the Sutras being an author less in a way and, and more fluid and etc. And this is of course, for example, the distinction that was done uh, earlier by Professor Rueck, for example, and, uh, and, and, and Steichelner has, has uh, uh, a point that is representing this. Um, so I was wondering, in, the, in this particular case, actually one of uh, 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 Steichelner's other uh, 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 student, uh, Krasser, uh, actually even started relativizing mm -hmm. the very notion of an Ur text mm -hmm. in the question of Shastras. Mm -hmm. Uh, for particular cases like the Tarkajvada, where mm -hmm. uh, texts uh, emerge, Shastras mm -hmm. attached to a particular name emerged out of the notes of students and were edited later. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But in, in, the, in the particular case of the, um, of the, the Fan Wanjing, so to, 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 to zoom back onto the, the kind mm -hmm. of Sutra Jean, uh, I, I was wondering, so, um, because you, you seem to, uh, to take the earlier version as, as a bit, in a way, uh, hesitant and ambiguous, and, uh, and this in itself seems to be representing not so fun, an, uh, an, early, an early situation. Uh, but I was wondering whether you would qualify this as really the, the Ur version uh, or uh, a frozen written version of something very lively that is still go going on and for which we have only. Mm. Uh, very rare witnesses, mm. and if you could develop a little bit on the, mm. on how what you understand as the kind of early state of formation of the of the Fan um. mm. So I try to mm, qu clearly distinct uh, uh, distinguish the two cases: the, the earliest form and the later form. But the question is that what about the original form? And that is a very important question. But as far as I check, I, as far as I carefully try to carefully check uh, the possibility of the earliest form, it is very difficult to assume the, the Ur text in a very clear and um, uh, non-ambiguous text. In that case, uh, suppose uh, the original text is very clear, then we don't uh, explain why such a mm, strange, unclear text was produced later and then mm, came back to the original one in later period. And as far as I check earliest manuscript, and uh, by using especially by using three manuscripts and the oldest manuscript uh, commentary by Tian Tai Chi, then all of them suggest this form. So there is no mm, old source which suggests the other possibilities, so the yeah, at least philologically. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a limit of my present situation and someone else may, may find the new text, which is very old and very close to the later text, but I think it is uh, not very, it is not very likely. And uh, of course, uh, I like to assume that the original form is very close to this one, 
Yet, I have to admit the difference between the old text, which is Uo text, which I can't hear, and the, the second oldest one, which I called earliest extant text. The, the reason is that uh, in some commentaries, especially in the Tian Tai Chi's oldest commentary, there is a quotation of sutras, the Fanwanjin passages, which does not appear in any of texts. And the Tian Tai Chi's commentary is the oldest one. Therefore, I would like to assume that uh, Ua text has a little different version, different phraseology and expressions, which disappears for some reason. And we cannot place, uh, uh, we cannot put that passage in the correct place. So it's just a list of the unidentified old passage. Therefore, that is the, the, the evidence for assuming the slight difference between Ua text and the earliest version. I don't like to say that this earliest version is the original text. That's what, what I don't mean. Thank you. And also, uh, maybe the question is, uh, goes to the, the formation of Vinaya too. Because uh, Fanwanjin is the Mahayana type of Vinaya, according to Chinese understanding. Of course, this is not a Vinaya, but a kind of monastic rule yep. and lay rule, which has equivalence, equivalent in, in the form of Vinaya in Sanskrit text and the Pali text. But I don't have any special idea about that. I, yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed it. And there are many, many, many things that you mentioned are really inspiring. And I, I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss this uh, in detail. Um, I, maybe, well, I should say something also uh, in defense of the larger Pranya Paramita. By <laughs> 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 no, and the, the thing is that I don't think that the reason why there are so few variants is is really due to the text itself, because all of Xuanzang translation have very few variants. Uh -huh. So I just had a quick look at, um, for instance, the Mahavibhasha, also there are very, very few variants, mm -hmm. and in other texts. And I think the reason is that at the time, the transition between translation and transmission was very, very smooth and very, very quick, in fact. So we, there are these, these very interesting manuscripts uh, produced in Chang'an, studied by um, uh, Fuji and Akira, and they show that the texts were copied by uh, scriptoria, which also overlapped in part with translation teams. So basically, the, the quality of the transmitted text was fairly high from the beginning, and so generally I think there was less room for you know the kind of scribal errors that we find, like in the case of earlier texts. Sorry, that's how I felt I had to <laughs> so you want to say something. And, but I had the question about, because I find very, very intriguing and suggestive, the fact that these earliest, I mean, the earliest text that you can reconstruct, be that the original, that we don't know, but the, the earliest one, indeed, linguistically, is very odd as a Chinese text. It's very odd. And so since we seem to know that, I mean, we know that this is an apocryphal text, the oddity and this kind of wooden syntactic quality which you can clearly show is regularized. Right? It does remind me of early translation. So I wonder if that's not the, this kind of uh, syntax, odd syntax. It might not be a way to, a, an attempt to reproduce the language of translation. In a way, you know, these people knew how to fabricate text. I mean, Chi Xin Lun is another case of a text which is clearly apocryphal, and it's quite carefully crafted as a translation in the use even of syntactical mm -hmm. construction. Mm -hmm. So I just, I don't know, I, I'm, uh, that's something that came to my mind. I don't know whether mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. I feel, I, I have the impression that the, the original author of the Fan Wan Jin has a very strong consciousness about the translation style. Ah, okay. And uh, they want to follow and they want to make it appear as if it was translated. Exactly. And it does, I mean. And uh, sometimes the, the, 
very odd sequence of words, which is not easy to understand, is uh, they th they thought it is a common character of oh. Chinese Buddhist translation. It's very interesting. Mm. Yeah. But uh, another point I would like to add is that this is not known so far. This is my new contribution, I think. So far, only Taisho and the Taisho edition and the base text, such as the second Korean version, was used. And even reading these uh, uh, woodblock print editions, some modern scholars claim wanted to claim that Fan Wanjin's wording was very strange and uh, difficult to read and grammatically incorrect sometimes. Therefore, they would like to assume that the author of the Fan Wanjin was not Chinese, but Central Asian. <laughs> but I, I don't like to agree with the idea. It is too hasty conclusion. And uh, thinking about my case or my friends or any students around me, I have a lot of, I know a lot of examples who are Japanese, but their Japanese is very bad. <laughs> so it is uh, concerned with the level of education, I think. And in case of monastics, for example, uh, some, of, some Chinese monastics is very bad, may be bad at writing. So uh, from the bad quality of uh, writing style, we cannot conclude that the author is not Chinese. It is too much and too hasty, I think. Uh, first of all, I'd like to echo what uh, Professor Zacchetti said, th thanking you, but also um, for raising very many stimulating questions. Thank I want you. to ask you about a single one of them right now, which is that if I understood you right, you, uh, you proposed a kind of contrast between this fluid situation of um, Indian Buddhist scriptures, let's say in Sanskrit, to, to be vague about it, and the situation that you find in the, in, the, in the text that you have studied here, in that what you propose, what I understood you to propose is a kind of anarchy in the Indian situation, lots of variants, lots of, um, lots of, maybe variant is the wrong word, lots of different wording, and here, what you see is a kind of self-conscious revision. Have I understood you right so far? Yeah. OK, because I wonder if, I'm not sure I agree with that, but I wonder if partly that picture emerges because the chronology of the sources is so clear, thanks to your work, whereas in the Indian case, we have no idea of the chronology of the sources, so we can't develop a hypothesis of revision. I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I started my work, uh, I have to. I want to talk about the background of my interests, research interests. And first of all, when I found such a different variety of different wording and uh, variant readings in the Fan Wanjin, I immediately wanted to connect this situation with Indian Mahayana texts. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I try to find the preceding case studies, which uh, very nicely uh, deal with this type of text in, in the field of Mahayana, Indian Mahayana, but I could not find. Mm -hmm. Only the recension A, recension B, or Kashigara text like this, and there is no comparison, just a list of the enumeration and there is no analysis. Therefore, I cannot, I gave up using such a text. And instead, I would like to uh, make my own version then uh, in a, as a next stage by using computer, actually. I'm not very good at computer, but uh, I have some friends who are skilled in computer program and so on. So I try to ask them to make a program to deal with this kind of text as a software. But uh, uh, many of them just told me that 
don't do like that. Don't think in that way. The writing and uh, the, the computer software is so not so easy. <laughs> and you need some uh, platform text or pa platform methodology on which we have some variant or change of application form. So I thought at first that uh, I wanted to relativize each text, not absolutize the original text. So by choosing the, which one do you like to make focus on, then if I choose this one, then this text comes in the front. And then as critical apparatus, other text is listed in this way. And we can use double <laughs> monitors and so on. But uh, mm, the computer specialist of my uh, acquaintance just said that in order to do that, you should present your own idea in a printed version. Otherwise, no, can, no one among computer specialists can make the software like this. Because, uh, of course, this is good for, in the case of the Fan Wan Jin. But uh, if you like to use multilingual sources, then the situation changes quite a lot. And in the case of the Fan Wan Jin, uh, all, nearly all of the, the variant readings is uh, related with a small change, minimum change. And there is no uh, <coughs> difference like the change of chapters and addition of chapters and so on. Just a small number of the minimum change was made. But it is quite different in the case of Prajna Paramita Sanskrit text or Satdharma Pundarika in in. So in order to uh, use, for the use of such a different type of text, you have to make a really good program in advance, <laughs> which I can't do. Therefore, what I did here is uh, just uh, one <laughs> example in the case of the Fan Wanjin. This is not the time to go into detail about this, but <laughs> my new research project is exactly to build this system. <laughs> so, so, please. We can talk about it later. Yeah. yeah. This so, is being done. Uh huh, uh huh, good. Not built by me, obviously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the next thing I should do is just. Join my research team. <laughs> no, no, no. I just. I'm a simple user, so. <laughs> Not a programmer. I want to use that. Yeah. Thank you. And after this promotion of a newly established project, is there any maybe last question? Uh, ah, there are two. Uh, you, you raise your hand first, so yes, and then Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for talk. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I have a very tiny question uh, regarding Yu Xian. Because you mentioned that the state is like 1163, that's uh, in the Thousand Song Dynasty, but then you mentioned him in the Northern Song figure. I'm not sure how you would date the text, because if it's Northern Song, then that must be the Huizong period, which is very interesting period. So mm -hmm. do you see any kind of, because we all know that uh, the religious policy, policy in the Huizong period is very interesting, um, it changes a lot, and also involves a lot of uh, pronunciation, and we like really on the side of Darwin. So um, do you see any kind of uh, that, uh, I don't know, um, the government policies influence on his uh, on the context of the construction of this text, or like in regarding yeah, yeah, this mm. one. And if we can date it, of course. Yeah, sure. dating is not clear. That's why I just indicated uh, his death year. Even the 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 year of birth is not known. Okay. Yeah. I mean, considering that, then it might be uh, actually a more southern song figure, Gaozhong but uh, as far as I check, this author, Yu Shen, uh, refers to only manuscripts reading and not woodblock print. Okay. And I don't know why, but uh, that is his uh, uh, circumstances and surroundings. And then we do not see like, an influence from the uh, central government uh -huh. or religious policy. Uh -huh. So, yeah. 
The another one, the Fazan also, the yeah, Fazan is well known. Uh, this person. And his uh, life period is certain, but we cannot identify the exact year of the composition of this text. So. Question. Uh, last question, and then we, we go for next. Thank you, Mr. Um, I was wondering about uh, your method of critical editing, because uh, as we know, critical editing is based on the assessment of errors. And in your case, as you mentioned, the most of the uh, revision uh, recommendations starting from the beginning of the 8th century actually consist in the improvement, stylistic improvement of the text. So I wonder what, I, what you are actually doing when you uh, choose from among the, error, the variants. So are you supposed to choose the worst, stylistically worst variant from the error? Uh, from the in case of the earliest version. The earliest version, but stylistically you're choosing the worst one? No, no. <laughs> I, I simultaneously compared the one Chinese Zhonghua manuscript and Chinese, but uh, Japan, yes, ver Japanese Tokyo version, and uh, another version the, in 757. And in order to choose the original, uh, to judge this is the original one, I did not, my principle is not so simple, actually. And not always, I did not always uh, chose the oldest one. And I did not always chose the most difficult reading. I know what you mean, because uh, usually the very strange uh, variants can be the oldest one then because it doesn't it is not understandable therefore other later authors want to uh, uh, rewrite in a clear way the, that is uh, really typical in the case of the, the the text of the second Korean version this one this is really this text is full of reasonable readings, but not very old. This is just a the logical reading as a result of compromising. <laughs> okay, uh, so it remains to thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, um, one thing. Please give me one thing I want to show. I, I forgot to give you the final one. Oh. This is. <laughs> <laughs>